communism and its memory. 25 years ago, communism, the political system dominant in Eastern Europe, collapsed. Two years later, in 1991, the Soviet Union also dissolved. The People's Republic of China remained the sole communist power, but throughout the 1990s, the anti-capitalist party line was watered down through the introduction of market-oriented reforms. Today, only one country can be said to be truly communist, North Korea. Once a mighty geopolitical force, holding half of Europe in its grip and roughly one-third of the world's total population in the 1980s, communism today is confined to an internationally isolated prison state, one of the poorest countries on the planet. How are we to remember the past of a utopia? By recounting the utopian dream, or maybe by still dreaming the dream, hoping for it? After all, as the French philosopher Alain Badiou puts it in his book, The Communist Hypothesis, published a few years ago, I quote, communism is still the right hypothesis. And those who disagree with him resign themselves to the market economy and to parliamentary democracy, which in Badiou's eyes are the true evils of our time. But was communism just a dream? Was it just a hypothesis? Did it not affect many real humans? Were not millions of lives destroyed in its name? According to the Black Book of Communism, published in 1997, communism claimed around 100 million victims around the globe some 65 million in Mao's China, some 20 million in the Soviet U Union, and so on. Well, you would say, communism is a beautiful dream, but it does not work in practice. However, one could ask the following question. What sort of beauty are we supposed to attach to a dream which, when it is forced upon reality, turns into a nightmare? Why shouldn't the political vision be primarily judged by what it actually achieves? Since 1989, we have witnessed two quite different ways of remembering communism, especially here in Europe. Almost two disjoint cultures with no relation to one another. The first way of remembering communism is commemorative and retributive. It is backward looking. The second way of remembering communism is affirmative and reconstructive. It is forward-looking. More precisely, the first way looks at the past of the communist utopia as a past utopia. A utopia which has been here, has left its mark and is now gone for good. This way, of con this way is concerned with what burdens and liabilities there are with communism passing through the world and, uh, and leaving it again. The second way of looking at communism looks at the past of the communist utopia as something that has not realized the utopia's full potential, as something that has done, not been here yet. This way is concerned with the past only as a signpost for our still bright communist future. It is clear that the backward-looking culture developed almost exclusively in Eastern Europe, the place where communism reigned for four decades. <coughs> Since 1989, communism has been engaged with in Eastern Europe in a variety of ways, but all backward-looking. Its ideology has been critically investigated. Legal restitution and retribution have been sought to some successful extent, Political lustration has been attempted, victims rehabilitated, memorials and museums built. To give you some example, an example of that, so this is the memorial of the victims of communism in Romania, so the country where I was born, in Siget, in the northwest part um, of, the, of the country. And so this is a very important um, sculpture, a group sculpture, made by uh, Romanian sculpture, Procession of the Sacrifice, it is called. 
here are a few more examples of how communism is being remembered in Eastern Europe, not in Western Europe. So this is a poster taken from the Museum of Communism in Prague. As you see, a um, rather harsh depiction here of Stalin. Dream, reality, nightmare, occupation, revo revolution. Here is another poster. Museum of Communism is here. Um, also, it has, of course, the under underlying uh, anti-Russian sentiment. Here is another one. It was a time of happy, shining people. The shiniest were in the uranium mines <laughs> in, in the Gulag. OK, and now we move on. By contrast, there are those which, uh, who still enjoy the dreaming of communism, thinking of communism as the right hypothesis. When I was writing this talk, I was sitting at some point in a cafe in Brussels. In front of me, on the wall, was this poster. The Red Army was depicted as a symbol of popular culture, as something cool, really. That's the term to capture this. At my own university in England, I have seen students wearing this T-shirt. See, I don't know whether you have seen people, young people often wearing this one. So Stalin and Mao are depicted here as cool party animals. Of course, they were two of the greatest mass murderers in history. In Lyon, so in, the, in, uh, in France, you can visit a restaurant called AKGB, at KGB, which describes itself as a place, as an authentic place full of myth between tradition and modernity, Avec un dépensement garanti, to translate it, where you are guaranteed the experience of being transported to an unfamiliar surrounding. No doubt, so this of course invites irony, no doubt the roughly 18 million Russians who ended up in the Siberian slave camps were also being transported to unfamiliar surroundings. The KGB giving its name to an establishment where, here you have it at the bottom, where boire, manger, uh, and so on, um, c'est toujours révolutionnaire. Such restaurants and bars exist, of course, elsewhere in the Western world, and I understand even in Stockholm there is a KGB bar. Let's not go there tonight. These examples show that communism has become part of our free-willing Western cultural imagination. And with neo-communist authors like Slavoj Žižek, Alain Badiou, Terry Eagleton, and so on, communism is also gaining again the further 1989 slips into the past, prominence with various audiences. So how are we to remember communism? as a dream or as a nightmare, the right hypothesis or a terrible hypothesis. If we understand by Marxism or communism the idea that the abolition of private property driven by the proletariat will establish a classless society, egalitarian classless society, lacking any sort of oppression, then Marxism and communism, as the Polish philosopher Leszek Kolakowski once said, was indeed the greatest fantasy of the 20th century. However, in another sense, Marxism communism was a very real project, and as such, it failed. Now, there is a popular argument employed to deny that communism has been refuted by the failure um, of the Soviet Union and its allies. For the Soviet Union, the objection goes, the GDR, the People's Republic of Poland, uh, Socialist Romania, etc., were not communist countries. Why not? Because they were uh, oppressive states. So you can't be a communist country if you are an oppressive state, according to this argument. And since there never has been a communist state, according to this argument, Communism has not been refuted by history. I believe that this argument is false. It is not in the interest of a communist 
to turn his doctrine into a mere irrefutable ideal, but this is what this argument does. Otherwise, communism will become like a sort of religious belief or doctrine. It would be removed from the sphere of the science of politics, and it will lose its redemptive core, the aim to solve the problems of concrete human societies. Hence, to establish whether a certain political system has been realized or not, we need to be able to have a method of checking, of testing, independently of our political preferences, whether or not communism <coughs> has arrived. In other words, we must be able to specify descriptive conditions for the realization of a political system. These descriptive conditions must be independent of a normative evalu evaluation of a political system. Here is a simple analogy. You have an architect and he announces to you, I shall be build an earthquake resistant building. He builds his building, an earthquake arrives and the, the building collapses. Now you wouldn't accept his excuse to, to the extent that he says, well, that was not really the sort of building I, I wanted to build because it collapsed. I wanted to build an earthquake resistant, resistant building and that was not it. Of course, that's absurd, right, this sort of events. We would say, wait a second, you announced you will build this building in this location with exactly these parameters. So you have done that. So the descriptive conditions are in place for, for the building of your building. And now if the building fails to satisfy your normative promise, then you have failed in the normative sense. Similarly, in the case of communism, we have descriptive conditions for communism coming to power, especially the abolition of private property, the dictatorship of the proletariat, and then in the Leninist tradition, the, the one-party rule. And in addition, we have a normative evaluation, communism being an egalitarian and just society, or a communist state being an egalitarian and a just society. So what about communism then? The descriptive conditions of communism were certainly satisfied in Eastern Europe. Private property was nationalized everywhere after 1945, broadly speaking, and the dictatorship of the proletariat, represented by the one communist party, was established. So what does the normative evaluation of the societies thus constructed tell us? As Anne Applebaum As Anne Applebaum has demonstrated in her recent book, Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 to 1956, communism was imposed by the new Soviet rulers after the Second World War, according to a more or less identical pattern, consisting of four stages. First, the NKVD built in every country a secret police, the necessary tool for the subsequent steps of suppression of the opposition. To consider the example of my own native country, Romania, here the infamous secret service Securitate, the security of the people, as its official name was, was founded by a decree as a new organ inside the interior ministry in August 1948, after the old Romanian secret service, the Siguranza, had been infiltrated by Soviet agents. The scope of this new organ was explicitly stated in its constitution in this decree as the defense of the conquests of democracy against the internal and external enemies. So note here a certain martial language if you want. The decree also stipulated the death penalty against anti-communist activities such as, among other things, other things, the economic progress of the country. So people were killed for being opposed to the economic progress of the country. Second, as a second step of repression, the mass media were taken over all over the, uh, Eastern Europe and they became propaganda tools, especially the radio, which back then was the main mass medium. Thirdly, various parts of the civil society were harassed and even eventually forbidden, be they church or youth organizations, etc. 
while at the same time the Communist Party was strengthened and in most cases taken over by party cadres who had been trained for this task in special ideology schools in the Soviet Union. So in this book, if you haven't read it, you should look at it, it's, uh, it's fascinating. Um, to what extent these cadres actually had been trained already during the Second World War um, in, in these ideology schools in uh, the Soviet Union. And fourthly, ethnic cleansing through deportation took place um, throughout Eastern Europe. These four steps made up the first wave of repression. Then came the second, more violent wave. In the two years after the Second World War, three elections had taken place in most Eastern European countries occupied by the Soviets. A major reason for this is simply the fact that the Stalinists had trusted that the propaganda delivered by the mass media would suffice to convince the majority of the population to vote for the local Communist Party. This, however, did not happen. Astoundingly, no Communist Party managed to obtain more than one-third of the votes in any free election in this short period after the Second World War. Moreover, since society was resisting Communist rule, more aggressive measures were taken to bring into conformity society with Marxist ideology. All forms of opposition were prohibited, especially also traditional bourgeois parties, so pre-war pre, pre parties, interwar parties. Show trials uh, were uh, put into place. The convicts of the show trials were executed or sent to labor camps. And the system of informers was put into place to survey and control the population. The net effect of these first years of Stalinization was that the half, half of the continent was effectively stripped of basic political and economic rights. There is something puzzling about this outcome. No communist government came to power through a free vote and consequently, no communist government was democratically legitimate because it did not represent the will of the people. This fact stood in con so this lack of legitimacy, this fact stood in contradiction to the nominally democratic constitutions the communists installed in, in Eastern Europe. Again, to give you the example of Romania, so the Romanian constitution of 1948 in article number three stipulates that all state power emanates from and belongs to the people, I'm citing here directly from the constitution, and that the people exert their power through universal, equal, and secret vote. So you'd think that liberal democracy is in place. This basic contradiction between the constitution and the will of the people on the one hand, and the ruling communist power and ideology on the other indicates that there was something surreal about the communist rule. Marx had stated that the, proletariat, that the proletariat was the engine of historical progress, and Lenin had added that the party was the vanguard of the proletariat. Both claims were meta-historical claims, stating necessary and indubitable truths about the historical direction of mankind and its ultimate redemption. By necessity, men will become free and equal in communism, and by necessity, they will want communism. This prediction was an essential part of Marxism, derived from the scientific, with scientific certainty from dialectical materialism, or through dialectical materialism. But in fact, the proletariat, once given the choice, that is, free elections, did not bring the communists to power. The Marxist prediction failed. Society displayed a tendency to take a development different from what the doctrine was dictating. Given a choice, many workers and many peasants voted for non-communist parties, for instance, for the Peasants' Party in Romania also for the Peasants' Party in, uh, in Poland, and so on. The communists could have accepted, of course, this democratic outcome, and they could have become one of several players in a multi-party system, as we have it uh, today all over Europe. 
but this would have meant to adapt to a reality which is contradicting their, their ideology, in which there was no room for other political parties. Instead of adapting to reality, the communists set out to adapt reality to their doctrine. Hence, the need for oppression emerged to make society conform to theory rather than vice versa. I will now give you some examples of how ideology met reality. One concerns my own uncle, also called Edward Canteria. He was born in 1950 in Romania and attempted at the age of 17, so still a teenager, to escape over the border one night. A few months later, as he would have turned 18, his conscription order into the Romanian army should have arrived, and the Romanian army did not miss anybody. We can be sure of that. But it didn't. The order did never arrive, never arrive. So what did, he, what did my family infer from that? That in all likelihood he was shot at the border as thousands of other Romanian citizens have been. And if you are interested in this, uh, Hertha Müller, in a novel called in English, um, The Appointment, but called in German, Heute wäre ich mir lieber nicht begegnet, probably it's translated into Swedish as well, an excellent novel. She describes one such shooting in great and um, very, very uh, powerful detail. In, in, in this book. Why did this order for my uncle to, into the army never, never come? Well, the officialities obviously knew that there was no point sending a conscription order to a ghost. My family has never heard anything from Edward. His name does not appear in any archives we know of, and we have done some research on this, but many other archives are still inaccessible. In the Armenian cemetery in Bucharest, there is an empty grave with his name, which is my name exactly, um, Edward Kanterian. In fact, I was called after, after him, I was recently told. Another example, again of a Romanian Armenian, was recently recounted to me by my father. This was the case of a man called Manuk Kantarian, no relation to my family. He was of profession, train conductor on a wagon lead. One day, during the high time of Stalinism in the 1950s, he was denounced by his housekeeper for possessing a collection of watches. The police arrested him. I found, only very recently, an entry on this man in a Romanian dictionary entitled The Victims of Communist Terror, Imprisoned, Tortured, Incarcerated, Murdered uh, by a Survivor of Communist Prisons Cicerone Ionizoyu. Here is the entry. Kantarian Manuk, born on the 20th of September, uh, 27th of December 19, uh, sorry, 1892 in Asia Minor, so Turkey, arrested in 1951, died during detention in one of the camps at the Canal on the 26th of December 1952. So quite soon, one year after he was arrested the canal. In the early 1950s, this was a name of horror, connecting the co connected to the construction of an artificial shortcut between the Danube and the Black Sea. Much of this canal was built by means of political prisoners, slave workers, really, people like Manu Kantarian, who had been identified as internal enemies of the communist economy. And here comes, of course, some additional irony, because Manuk, being an Armenian, born in Turkey, he survived the 1915 genocide, which next year will be 100 years uh, um, old, only to die in a Romanian communist camp for possessing a collection of watches. So let's go back to Alain Badiou. Was communism the right hypothesis? <clears throat> Tens of thousands of these slaves were kept in their labor camps at any one time. We don't know their precise numbers, nor the precise numbers of the casualties, but we have a pretty clear picture of the subhuman conditions under which they lived and died, as reported by survivors, as in the case of the Nazi camps, not in the case of the 
uh, death camps. Uh, this is one big difference between, I think, communism and Nazism. So the communists didn't really have um, death camps. <clears throat> Here is a related description about the political prisoners in a Siberian gulag camp. There, behind the barbed wire, was a row of creatures distantly reminiscent of human beings. There were ten of them, skeletons of various sizes covered with brown parchment-like skin, all stripped to the waist with shaved heads and pendulous withered breasts. Their only clothing was some pathetic dirty underpants, and their shin bones projected from concave circles of emptiness. Women, hunger, heat, and hard toil had transformed them into dyed specimens, that still unaccountably clung to the last vestiges of life. So this is taken from Anne Applebaum, uh, the Gulag, a history celebrated <coughs> by her that won the Pulitzer Prize. Sorry, where is the observation from? This is taken from a, a Gulag prisoner, but I don't have now the name. I can look it up for you if you want a later point. So this is a survivor uh, herself who, who witnessed this uh, scene. So these, uh, these women belong to the lowest category of the camps. These camps had a hierarchy, right? And if you went to the bottom of it, that's how you ended up. <clears throat> Examples could be multiplied from many other places. One of the worst was the educational camp at the outskirts of the Romanian city of Pitești, where in 1949-52, to 52, a barbaric experiment, educational experiment, was undertaken to blur the distinction between victim and perpetrator. The experiment was based on the recruitment of inmates as torturers and re-educators of their fellow inmates, often their best friends. And this was done by various means. They were, for instance, beating into unconsciousness, eating excrements, sexual abuse with anti-Christian connotations if the person in question was a Christian, and many other such things. Here is a recollection of an inmate turned into a torturer. Kostake Oprishan was almost a corpse. Another inmate laid him down, tied up his feet with ropes, called the others and myself, and ordered to beat Oprishan. I was handed the club. I stopped thinking and was just hitting. It was not a threat which made me hit, but a confusion. I was beating the man whom I most treasured, my friend, my master, my brother, the man for whom I was ready to give my life. One of the main project leaders of this Pitesht experiment, Eugen Surkanu, initially a member of the fascist Iron Guard, later a member of the Communist Party, kept a meticulous diary of nearly 2,000 pages about the measures of Marxist re-education and their concrete, its concrete results. Part of these measures were pseudo-religious or quasi-religious sermons held by Tsukanu. Here is an example, again recounted by a survivor. I am Tsukanu, the first and the last. I am the true gospel. I already have what to write on, your corpses. If Christ had gone through these hands, he would not have made it to the cross. He would have not resurrected, there would not have been any Christianity. Uh, if you like Nietzsche, it sounds a bit like the Antichrist in Nietzsche. <clears throat> One might say that Zulkanu was insane, of course. But then again, were the prison guards insane, the prison director, the Securitate officers running not just the Pitesht prison, but the whole penitential system of camps and prisons spread all over Romania, also just a result of individual insanity. According to investigations by Romulus Rusan, the co-founder of the Siget Memorial, so I showed you a um, picture before, Siget Memorial of the Victims of Communism in Romania, there were some 240 detention centers in the Stalinist period in Romania alone, in which at least 800,000 people were imprisoned over time for political reasons. So not ordinary criminals, as it were. 
The Secretary of Interior, Teohari Georgescu, who was responsible for this um, in last instance, reported in 1952 that the internal and external enemy had been hard hit during his tenure in 1945 to 1952, with, I quote, over 100,000 bandits arrested and sentenced for conspiring against our regime by the Securitate. And he added, fortunately, our officers have been very well instructed in class hatred, that's his term, and so they shall be in the future as well, hopefully. The blueprint of this pattern of thinking and acting can be traced back to the Soviet Union. The Gulag was the huge Soviet penitential system of slave labor and educational camps for political opponents. There were some 480 camp systems, camp systems, imagine that, each one, according to an Applebaum, made up of hundreds, if not thousands, of individual camps of individual camps and lakpuns, sometimes spread out over thousands of square miles of otherwise empty tundra, mostly imprisoning peasants and workers, some 18 million of them between 1929 and 1953, so only within 24 years, two and a half decades, of which roughly four and a half million died in detention, in the most abject conditions you can imagine. In December 1917, a few weeks after the Bolshevik takeover, Lenin created, by one of his very first official degree, decrees, I don't know how many here know this, the Cheka. The secret police, later converting into the NKVD and the KGB. By another early official decree, Lenin also created a gulag, again, this is not very well known. He created a political concentration camps, which were run by the Cheka. In its first two years alone, and especially during the Red Terror Campaign of 1918, mm -hmm. the Cheka executed countless counter-revolutionaries and enemies of the people, so I'm quoting here from their own directives, with an official death toll of at least 8,000 to 12,000. So that's one year alone. Although some plausible um, estimations mention figures like 50,000 casualties, a quarter of a million casualties, or even more. It's very, very hard to, uh, to track this, uh, these victims' numbers because they did not keep track of them. Yes, unlike the Nazis, they didn't keep track of them. Under Stalin's Great Terror Campaign of 1937 to 38, some 680,000 counter-revolutionaries were killed by the Cheka, according to Donald Rayfield's study, Ta Stalin and his hangman, which he, bases, he based on archival. So this book is based on archival researches when they were still available, because now uh, Putin has closed many hospital archives in Russia. The Cheka executors were operating in a methodical manner, following quotas for how many enemies were to be killed in a given, in a given region. They did not shy away from a more industrialized mass killing to reach these quotas, this number of victims. In some regions, they guessed their victims. For instance, in 1937, anticipating the same Nazi technology by three years, because the Nazis started guessing um, and euthanizing uh, disabled people in 1940. Here is a quote from Rayfield. Trucks advertising bread drove around the, the Urals, pumping exhaust gases into the rare compartment where naked prisoners lay roped together in stacks until their loads were ready for the burial pit. While such technological precision was a later development of the Cheka, the systematic intent to kill opponents was manifest from the beginning. Witness this poem from 1921 by a certain Alexander Aiduk, a Cheka executioner. 
There is no greater joy, no more beautiful music than the cracking of broken lives and bones. And that is why I want to write something steadfast concerning your verdict. To the wall, fire. I do published this poem, that's just a part of it, in an anthology called The Smile of the Cheka. Another Czechist, Martin Lachis, was the editor of a journal in which statistics about execution rates were published. They were proud of these activities. He wrote in 1921, The Cheka is the battle organ of the party of the future. The Cheka annihilates without a court trial, or it isolates from society by imprisoning in concentration camps. Its word is law. When interrogating, do not seek material evidence or proofs of the accused, sorry, of the accused's words and deeds against Soviet power. The first question you must ask is this. What class does the accused belong to? What education, upbringing, origin, or profession does he have? These questions must determine the accused's fate. This is the meaning and essence of the Red Terror. It doesn't judge the enemy, it strikes him. Such passages demonstrate the great extent to which terror was part of an official policy, intertwined with the communist ideology, institutionalized in the very first stage of communism. So the question as to whether or not Tsurkanu, our Romanian friend, was insane is a misleading question. It attempts to make the communist crimes a matter of individual psychology, when in fact they were an expression of the system's nature from the outset, whether in the early Soviet Union after the First World War or in Romania in the 1950s. There cannot be any doubt then that communism failed as a political doctrine and a real political power. Every communist state was a far cry from the paradise the doctrine proposed. So the normative evaluation, which I started with, of communist is in the negative, clearly. But what explains, explains the criminal energy under communism, if not individual insanity? Collective insanity? That's just a metaphor. We need to explain what united and motivated these criminals of a different, over different periods of time in very different countries? The obvious answer, already suggested, is the communist ideology itself, Marxism and then its extension, Leninism and then its extension, Maoism and uh, uh, Red, the Khmer Rouge, I'm not to mention. Now, some Marxists will protest here as they will want to dissociate Marx's own political theory from its Leninist interpretation. For instance, according to Marx, the proletariat itself was bound to revolt in the due course of time. So the proletariat, in a sense, was still strong enough and free enough to revolt. But according to Lenin, the real proletariat was too weak to grasp the logic of history it was prone to embrace petty bourgeoisism and trade unionism. In other words, to succumb to preliminary forms of capitalism again. Therefore, Lenin believed, another agent was needed, professional revolutionaries, the intellectual vanguard of the proletariat, namely the Bolshevik party. It was then left to the party to impose communism mercilessly, one of the favorite words by Lenin, it's mercilessness. It is, of course, true that Marx's writings, especially his early ones, are much more open-ended than Lenin's political doctrines, and to some extent they are philosophically very interesting. But the path from Marx to Lenin, and then to Stalin and Mao, is not entirely spurious. Arguments to this end have been offered by various analysts for example, Alain Besançon, Martin Malia, Richard Pipes, Hans Kelsen, Helmut Plesner, Leszek Kolakowski. 
I shall now, for the remainder of the talk, briefly revisit Kolakowski's argument to make my case that there was a strong connection between Marx and uh, Marxism and Leninism. This argument is found in uh, Kolakowski's book one of his monumental main current of Marxism. This is a checkup I read, by the way, if you want to see it, with a sword very martial. <clears throat> According to Polakowski, there are three main motives of Marxism. The Romantic motive, the Faustian Promethean motive, and the Enlightenment motive. motive. So I'll discuss briefly each of them. The Romantic motive protests against the, the advent of modern liberal society in which men live in external relations to each other each seeking his advantage and being prevented from harming others by entering a social contract in which each man or each citizen partly gives up his freedom. The legalism of such a society entails some coercion, of course, and some control. These are our societies today. And, of course, they also contain some distinction between personal life and social role and the separation between citizens. Their relation, the relation between citizens, is entirely externally regulated by power relations and the abstract forces of the markets and of money. And of course, Marx hated money. He wanted a society without money. <laughs> Precisely the sort of capitalist alienation Marx attacked. Of course, in liberal democracies, such legalism is also meant to protect my freedom dignity and property against others and against the state. But for Marx, this legalism was worthless, just another side of capitalist alienation. By contrast, in communism, money and property would be abolished, and with them, any need for mediation and regulation between individuals and society would disappear. The needs and desires of all citizens would be in perfect harmony with one another. I quote from Kolakowski, instead of freedom being conceived in the liberal fashion as the private sphere of non-interference with others, in communism it becomes the voluntary unit of the individual with the fellow man. This would be a society embodying, of course, the famous um, Marxian principle for each according to his ability, to each according to his needs, formulating the critique of the Gotha program from 1875. So this was the first motive, the romantic motive. The second motive, the Faustian Promethean motive, this is less theoretical. It involves faith in humanity's unlimited powers of self-creation, in its ability to redeem, to save itself. Note, Faith in humanity's powers, not the individual's powers. The species as a whole, according to Marx, is able to progress with the, plur plur sorry, with the proletariat as its vanguard, even at the expense of many individuals. Marx had little concern for our various limitations and weaknesses, for human suffering, death, illness, age, sex, unless they were instrumental to social liberation. What is it that we can note here then in this Promethean motive in uh, Marx's thinking? A certain disregard, I would say, for the fragility of the individual human being, which is, I think, diametrically opposed to the ideals of the liberal democracy in which we live now. And thirdly, the enlightenment, enlightenment motive, that relates to Marx's belief in the existence of a deterministic set of social rules comparable to the laws of nature. These laws are studied by the science which Marx calls the dialectical materialism, and as long as these laws are recognized, these, uh, sorry, as long as they are not recognized, of course they impose themselves upon us with utmost necessity and we suffer under, under them. But as soon as we become Marxists and we see through these laws, we become fully conscious of them, their so-called necessity turns into our freedom. That's one of Marx's rather obscure um, arguments. 
Now, these were the three main motives according to Kolakowski. Even if these three motives capture key aspects of Marxist doctrines, how are they to explain communist, ter communist terror? After all, Marx developed a social philosophy open to a variety of interpretations. There is no obvious path from him to Lenin, to Stalin, and so on. But we need to look closer. One thing these three motives presuppose is an incredible confidence without any sort of actual evidence in the necessary arrival of a final point in mankind's development, in which all societal evils will be abolished and all conflicts will end. The romantic motive articulates the main features of this future paradise as a state in which all differences in a society will be abolished. The Promethean motive expresses the voluntarist confidence in bringing about this paradise, even at the cost of human lives. And the Enlightenment motive gives this belief the necessity of a scientific theory, only adding to the confidence with which we are supposed to believe in it. We have a combination of utopian faith with scientific certainty, a rather good mixture for fanaticism and social engineering. <clears throat> Witness Lenin, here is one quotation uh, by him. The Marxist doctrine is omnipotent because it is true. It is comprehensive and harmonious and provides man with an integral world look. And here is another one related. Since the appearance of Marxist uh, Das Kapital, the materialist conception of history is no longer a hypothesis by a but a scientifically proven proposition. Kolakowski works out this Marx-Lenin lineage in great detail. It all eventually relates to the romantic motive of the unity of all society the abolition of all antagonisms, especially as given through private property, law, and the existence of the state, and external relations between its citizens. Freedom is hereby determined by the degree of unity in a society. You can't be free if the rest of the society is not un unified. The more antagonisms there are in, your, in the society you live, the less free you yourself can be. In a perfectly united society, communism, there cannot be any manifestation of the freedom of the individual citizen, which is not at the same time an expression of the unity of society. In particular, since the unity of society is represented by the proletariat, there cannot be any individual freedom which goes against the actions of the proletariat. If such resistance nevertheless arises, it will be a clash of class interests between two antagonistic political forces, the individual, the dissenting individual, and the proletariat. But of course, the communists already know who is the winner of this sort of clash, the proletariat. Hence, the clash between the individual conscience and the proletariat is entirely a relic of the past, from the communist point of view. The dissenting individual conscience has no right to exist. It cannot exist in communism, if communism is realized. To the extent to which it does exist, it is challenging the communist status quo and needs to be suppressed. Note that this logic does not identify merely the dissenting individual conscience as an opponent, so not only those who spoke up, not just the dissidents, as it were, but in fact, any sort of development which is digressing from what the party doctrine predicts. Of course, political and economic social reality is recalcitrant and can't be simply designed on a drawing board. From the outset, therefore, the communist project faced great economic difficulties. Hence, those involved in the economic difficulties, whether they had brought about these difficulties intentionally 
or merely accidental, they were simply part of that process, they didn't want it necessarily, were also identified as enemies of the system and as relics of the past. So if you look at uh, Lenin already gets very exasperated about this and uh, uh, he, he starts this war against the so-called uh, Kulaks, continued by, by Stalin. The need for the proletariat to weed out relics of the past was therefore a constant worry, indeed a paranoia of communist states. This worry about lapsing back to a pre- or non-communist state can be seen as one way of understanding the phrase communism and its memory. Thus emerged, right from the start, the need, first, for a special agency with, which has the full class consciousness and knowledge of the march of history, the party, and second, for an executive branch of the party to weed out the shadows of the past, dissenting individuals, reactionary forces, petty bourgeoisie, and so on. And that was, of course, the Cheka in the Soviet system, the Securitati in the Romanian one, the Stasi in the, uh, in the East German system, etc. So the Cheka, or the need for, for, for the Cheka, was the need for an ideological police force, the battle organ of the party of the future, as Martin Lachis presented it, applying not the liberal rule of law, but the ideological categories of class struggle. Remember what I quoted before from Lachis. What class does the accused belong to? That's the question that the Cheka needs, needs to ask. The ideological police being the articulation of the will of the party and the party being the articulation of the necessary march of history, there is no room in communism for a distinction between the rights of the individual versus the actions of the ideological police, okay? And hence no room for the possibility of a wrongdoing by the ideological police vis-a-vis -vis the individual. In other words, you can't, you can't sue the Cheka. That would have been entirely absurd in, the, in that system. And so the Cheka, Lachis told us, remember, annihilates without a court trial and isolates the class enemy from society by imprisoning in concentration camps. This logic explains the continuous presence of oppression and surveillance in communist states, the language of war of the party and the paranoia of the ideological police, ultimately a war by the party against the recalcitrant reality of human societal existence, a war against society. If this verdict is true, and you might disagree with it, it's very troubling. Marx, Engels, Lenin denounced all oppression and coercion, dreaming and desiring a society devoid of any sort of such things, of such bad things as oppression and coercion. But that means, of course, according, if we compare this to my doctrine, that we have an amazing and entirely terrible paradox happening here. So I'll try to spell this and uh, end with this. I will look just very briefly at Hans Kelsen, so one of the greatest, if not the greatest, some say, legal theorists of the 20th century. He defined the state in an essay from 1949, the state on Bolshevism, a very important essay, I believe, but very little known, to my surprise. He, he defined any state, not just the communist, any state whatsoever as a legal order. He calls it a legal order. What is that, a legal order? It's an order which tries to bring about... Here you are. It's an order which tries to bring about the desired human behavior by providing coercive acts as sanctions for the contrary behavior. So in other words, for Kelsen, you can't have a law without the potential possibility of sanctions if you violate the law. You can't have a law without a potential reference to what would happen if the law gets violated. According to this definition, every state, qua legal order, must necessarily involve some degree of coercion. He then continues, Kelsen, and says, a liberal state 
will involve a minimum degree of coercion, just as much as it is required to protect certain vital, certain vital interests such as life and property. By contrast, a totalitarian state will involve a maximum degree of coercion, providing little or no basis for the protection of life and property. Kelsen writes, Nationalization of economic production is the characteristic measure of expanding the scope of a state order towards totalitarianism, so the abolition of private property, in other words. And that was the essence of communism, I would add. By a bewildering paradox, precisely the attempt to abolish all societal coercion and the state as the greatest of all evils, led to the establishment of a state containing the highest degree of coercion and repression, a true Leviathan to this end. It is, that, it is for this reason that we must cultivate the memory of communism in a variety of ways, theoretical, historical, moral, as I have tried to exemplify in this talk. The memory of communism justifies the necessity of some coercion, some alienation in our liberal democracies in order to avoid the contingency, the calamity of total coercion and alienation as endured by our fellow Europeans in the East. I say that this is a troubling verdict because if some coercion and alienation is needed to sustain a human society, then this reflects a deep flaw in man as a social animal. The memory of communism helps us understand, first, the character of our own liberal societies, second, our own social nature, and third, the limits of all social radicalism, of all political theology. Maybe that shouldn't surprise us if we read the great classical German philosophers like Immanuel Kant, for in 1784 he already wrote, Also krumman holze, als voraus der Mensch gemacht ist, kann nichts ganz gerades gezimmert werden. Translated, from such a crooked wood as man is made of, nothing perfectly straight can be built. Thank you.